Hi, so I've been fortunate enough to define a couple of pretty interesting design trends in my career. And this all came from my need to precisely define what is going on in the industry and where UI design is heading. But we're not gonna talk about any of these today. Today, let's take a step back from modern design and let's go back in time. In this series, I will take a look at the history of user interfaces and especially one that just won't go away, skeuomorphism. Before we start, please keep in mind that some of the events here happened almost at the same time, so it's not gonna be completely chronological. Let's fly back past the super retina displays, past multi-touch, past gestures and even the mouse cursor. In 1977, Apple has released the Apple II and that was a personal computer revolution. I think we achieved that because Apple II went on to be the largest selling computer in the history of the world. Okay, but why was it revolutionary? Well, for starters, it was one of the very first successful personal computers ever created. The claim back then was that Apple II made computers accessible to more people because it was a lot easier to use. A personal computer that is more reliable and easier to use. So we can actually say that the Apple II had better user experience than most of the computers from that time. And the killer app of that time was a spreadsheet. Yeah. I'm not joking, really. People couldn't believe that they can actually enter data into a table and calculate their household expenses and stuff like that. So yeah, that was pretty revolutionary. And released in 1977, VisiCalc was the first practical spreadsheet for a personal computer. For many people, this actually justified buying the computer because before that time it was always like, yeah, you're just gonna get the computer to play games and now you had a spreadsheet so you can say like, no, I'm gonna really work on this thing. The Apple II had a text-based user interface, so you had to actually type in the commands and press enter to execute them. So that wasn't really that easy, but it had something pretty revolutionary, because it was one of the very first computers that could display color, and back in the day computers were mostly monochromatic, which means that they used just one color palette. Most screens were black and green or black and orange and i actually remember using one of those black and orange pcs many many years ago in games and in some of the apps colors were actually part of this whole ui revolution but of course the best was yet to come in 1984 followed by one of the most iconic ads created by ridley scott apple released the macintosh <laughs> January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. And the Macintosh was the first computer that used a desktop and a mouse-based interface. It was super revolutionary and maybe a little bit ahead of its time because it didn't really sell that well, but it paved the way for all of those modern interfaces that we know and love right now. But was that revolution really made by Apple? You've probably heard about the company Xerox. They were pretty big back in the day and they were mostly known for their copying machines. So basically you put in a piece of paper and you can get a direct copy from it. And many years ago the phrasing to actually make a copy of a physical document was to Xerox it. So yeah, they were pretty popular. In 1979, a 24-year-old Steve Jobs went to their R&D department called Xerox Park. Next to all the standard, you know, business as usual things that Xerox did, the Park R&D department was actually super revolutionary. They are the people who came up with the graphical user interface, the desktop, the mouse. They actually came up with the Ethernet standard, so they've created a lot of things and not many people actually know about it. So yeah, they were pretty happy with researching and developing, but they didn't really show all that stuff to anyone. But back in 1979, Xerox made a deal with Apple that Apple will sell them Apple shares that were actually going high pretty quickly at a reduced price, but Steve Jobs would have a chance to actually go into the R&D department and take a look. One of the things they showed me was object-oriented programming. They showed me that, but I didn't even see that. The other one they showed me was really a networked computer system. They had over 100 Alto computers, all networked, using email, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't even see that. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. 
Back then, all the computers were still completely text-based, so seeing a desktop and a mouse at Xerox Park made Steve Jobs super excited. He was surprised that Xerox didn't see the potential and wasn't really pushing this in any way, so he decided to actually do a lot of these things in his next computer, the Macintosh. And I know how it sounds, it seems like he went to the R&D department, saw something nice and just stole it, right? But it's not that simple, because the actual Xerox interfaces, of course, they were super revolutionary and they had the potential, but they weren't really as polished. So I would say that he got creatively inspired because the Macintosh actually improved with their interface on those Xerox interfaces in like a big way. So it wasn't a direct copy, it was basically taking what Xerox did as a baseline and then making it a lot better and a lot more consumer friendly. Hello. Macintosh. And before Macintosh, Apple tested some of these patterns in their Lisa computer, but it was $10,000 back in the day, so it was just too expensive for many people to actually get their hands on it. So a year later, all of those awesome UI patterns just made their way back to the mainstream with the Macintosh. And this is where skeuomorphism comes in. It all started with the desktop metaphor, because you were placing icons and files and folders on a virtual desktop. So that was the first real life kind of metaphor that were making it easier for people to understand what is going on. So you weren't really seeing blocks of text, you were seeing kind of like your desk, kind of like you really put your folders and your documents on your desk before you start working. Now, you see what I mean about the screen? It's very graphical. Here's a place to store information, a folder. And when some of the documents became unnecessary, you also had a trash bin that you could throw those documents into, kind of like in the real world and a place to get rid of information, a waste paper basket. Both the desktop and the trash can metaphor actually survived to this day because all of the major computer operating systems still use both of these. The idea behind skeuomorphism was that it allowed our brain to use those real world metaphors to understand something new faster, to understand the new technology. Because normally if you see a block of text, you know, kind of like what developers see every day, you are intimidated by it and you don't really understand what's going on. But if you see a desktop and a trash can icon, you instantly know what to do with it. If you see a folder on a desktop and then you drag it to the trash, you understand what happened, right? And it's a lot easier for you than to type in a terminal command to remove a file. Files and folders also allowed you to organize your computer the way you want it. So you can create your folders to create the structure that fits you exactly as you'd like to have it on your real life desk. Windows were being stacked on top of each other, kind of like real life documents on the desk and resizing them was done using clicking and dragging. So kind of like stretching things with our hands in the real life, like, you know, stretching out a rubber band. And the interface of Apple Lisa inspired Microsoft as well. So in in 1983 they released the first version of Windows and of course it wasn't really as polished and as user-friendly as Mac OS back then. And with time and with Apple as an inspiration, Microsoft was refining their OS to what will become the most popular OS on the planet. Then Windows 3.11 came, which was one of the most popular releases because it allowed you to actually have a little bit more visual fidelity in the OS. And then Windows 95 was a complete revolution. And actually all of the modern OSs are really similar to that. Even Windows 10 is very similar to 95 in many respects. They still have the desktop, they still have the trash can and the folders and the files. And just recently, Microsoft is modifying the icons to actually have a slightly different style because a lot of that style just carried over from 20, 30 years ago. In 1985, Steve Jobs was actually fired from Apple. He was replaced by a former Pepsi CEO, John Scully. But under this new direction, Apple's sales were actually going down. And Steve Jobs at that time founded Next and started to build a Next operating system that became later the foundation for Mac OS X. Of course, Steve returned to Apple and in 1998 he introduced the iconic iMac. Most of the work done on the next step OS actually transformed into Mac OS X. In 1992, Steve Jobs met someone who redefined skeuomorphism forever and pushed it to its limits. Scott Forstall was a designer that was responsible for the Aqua UI, a translucent glass-like interface with really complex animations, transitions and interactions. You know, when you design a new user interface, 
you have to start off humbly. You have to start off saying, what are the simplest elements in it? What, what does a button look like? And you spend months working on a button. That's a button in Aqua. It looked beautiful and for that time, an interface like that was just mind-blowing. During the presentation of the new OS, Steve famously said this. And we call that new user interface Aqua because it's liquid. One of the design goals was when you saw it, you wanted to lick it. And they added shadows under the windows to simulate depth, just to make it look a little bit more like the real world. One of the most impressive animations of that time that I still remember was dragging a widget onto the desktop. Because when you did that, it resulted in this beautiful, realistic ripple effect. Another skeuomorphic revolution of the time were the icons. Microsoft went with very simple pictograms, but Apple instead opted for something a little bit more photorealistic. So a lot of their icons of that time were actually 3D and they looked like the real objects, including the very nice looking metal recycle bin. This was skeuomorphism taking yet another step towards direct representation of real life objects. The iTunes icon looked like a CD and the calendar looked exactly like the wall mounted calendar with the red trim on the top. Your hard drive also had an icon that looked like the hard drive inside your Mac. The fidelity of these icons was actually mind-blowing. In many of these you could zoom in like a thousand times and notice little details that you were normally unaware of. One example is the text editor icon, which if you zoom in very closely you can see that it has actual text written on it and the text is the copy from that iconic Apple ad. These icons and the interface behind them would greatly inspire the upcoming 2007 iPhone OS. Another real life metaphor was the close, minimize and maximize icons that look like traffic lights. So green means maximize because it means go and red means stop so it means closing the window. Later with macOS Leopard, Apple also created a glass shelf for the dock for the icons to actually sit in to make this interface even more realistic. And that is it for today. Let me know if you want to see more parts of this series, including the iPhone, the minimal Metro UI, modern interfaces, material design, and everything that followed skeuomorphism. And if you haven't already, check out my UI book and my upcoming UI design course.